Thank you to, to everyone that is either at home or at work joining us today. And a huge thanks to the LBJ Foundation for hosting Austin's Energy Innovation Future. Uh, I cover Texas politics for KXAN here in Austin. And at a time that the new Biden administration is settling in and already taking on a number of actions on energy, it's a perfect time to have this conversation. Couldn't come at a better time. So some housekeeping to start. This is how things will work. I will introduce you to each of our esteemed panelists who you just heard about. who will share some opening remarks about Austin's energy future. I'll ask them some questions uh, of our panelists, and then we'll go to your questions where you can submit a question in the chat in the Zoom. So first up, we have Callie Taylor, the Director of Economic Development and Clean Energy Specialist for the Austin Chamber of Commerce, a position she's held for the past five years before joining the chamber. She worked in NRG, uh, Energy's Home Solar Division as the Director of Customer Retention, a position centered on her passion for renewable energy. Her background holds a variety of positions comprised of 10 years of consulting, marketing, training, and account management experience. I feel like I just introduced a prize fighter. So after all that, Callie, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to being here. And John, thank you for that great introduction. I think that's a little bit, uh, I, I feel like a prize fighter now. I don't know if I would have introduced myself quite like that, <laughs> but uh, great to be here. Um, as you said, my focus at the chamber is uh, focusing on bringing in new clean energy jobs here. So I think this could be a great conversation with Suzanne and Dr. Rye today. Look forward to it. Excellent, and a perfect segue. Um, thank you, Callie. Next up, we will have Dr. Varun Rai. He conducts in interdisciplinary research projects at the University of Texas at Austin, which focus on energy systems, complex systems, decision science, and public policy. Over the past 15 years, his research has been directed towards next generation carbon capture and storage, fuel cells, oil and gas, plug-in hybrid vehicles, to name a few. As a testament to his success, he uh, has presented at several important forums, including briefings for the United States Senate, Global Intelligent Utility Network Coalition, and Global Economic Symposium. His research group's work has been discussed in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Bloomberg News, among other venues, which include KXAN and local TV reporting. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Varun Rai. Great. Thank you so much, John, for having me. I'm really looking forward to that discussion. Uh, I really appreciate how stakeholders and, and members from different parts of the community that have really been active for years and years are part of this discussion. So looking forward to that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Rai. And for the past seven years, uh, Suzanne Russo has served as the CEO of Pecan Street, a cutting edge data research and product testing firm whose mission is to develop an innovative pathway for Austin to increase total generation from low carbon sources. Prior to joining Pecan Street, Suzanne Russo was the Director of uh, Sustainability Initiative for New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development, where she led the development of green building and sustainable retrofitting of municipally funded affordable housing. Forbes named Suzanne one of five women using technology to blow up social change. Suzanne, over to you, welcome. Hi, John, thanks so much for including me. I'm really excited about the conversation today with Callie and Varun and you. Um, and I also wanted to say a big thanks to Sarah McCracken for organizing this great event. Um, Sarah's husband, Brewster, actually is the founder of Pecan Street. He uh, thought up the whole idea for this organization when he was a city council member. And um, it's been my pleasure to, to take over the helm at the organization for the past two years, um, but I worked under Brewster before that when he was CEO of the organization. Awesome. Thank you, Suzanne. And we'll get back to you here in just a second. Next up, we have Nate Ryan, an entrepreneur, business leader, and organizer focusing on the convergence of creativity and economic growth. In my notes here, I'm supposed to call him Mr. Ryan. He's the CEO of Blue Sky Partners, a consulting firm. Nate plays a critical role in helping companies take full advantage of the resources available to them. As an economic impact expert, Nate understands the numerous benefits that clean energy brings to industries across Austin. I'll let him share some of those thoughts now. Mr. Ryan, Mr. Nate, over to you. Mr. Ryan is my, well, like we said before, before we kick this off, Pastor Ryan is my father, but Mr. Yeah. Ryan is also my father. You can just call me Nate. Um, I feel out of my league here uh, with Dr. Rye, uh, Callie, and Suzanne. I think it's going to be a really fun conversation. It's about the future of Texas and the opportunities that are in front of us uh, and the future of the U.S., uh, 
when it comes to our ability to take advantage of not only what I think is the right thing for us to do from a, a uh, environmental perspective, but turns out to be a pretty great economic investment too. So I'm excited to talk about all that. Excellent, Nate. Okay, so we will move on to some questions for our panelists. And I will first tee this one up to you, Callie, but anyone can jump in as they've got some feedback here. So as Austin has been experiencing tremendous economic growth over the past several years, what role does clean energy play in promoting growth, encouraging investment, and supporting businesses of all sizes across the city? Callie. Okay, sure. Well, it, what role does it play? It plays an enormous role. And I have I'll go into some additional information, but I think one of the biggest things is Dr. Rai and Suzanne, the work that they're doing is at, when companies are coming into a town, they are a large reason that these companies want to be here. It's a large part of what drives people into Austin is the work that the University of Texas and Pecan Street and organizations like that are doing with clean energy research. We're sort of renowned nationally and internationally for that um, work. And so I think that spurs investment as well, because companies that are coming in, they're looking at the kind of research that's here. They're wanting to partner with these organizations. They're wanting to bring um, their companies here and be a part of this ecosystem that's been built by so many individuals over uh, 20 years. The clean energy ecosystem has been being built here by individuals um, from UT and the, the business world to you know, bolster this uh, kind of clean energy they say clean energy reputation that Austin has. And so I think it plays an enormous growth. And also a lot of companies, whether they're traditionally would be considered in the renewable energy space, it is a priority for most corporations these days to uh, you know, support renewable energy. It's part of their um, corporate renewability, uh, like their ethos. And so the fact that Austin Energy, our municipal utility is so focused on renewables, that's a big Part of it for them. But in addition to that, um, our regional utilities are as well. So I and think it's, it's huge. Yeah, and Dr. Rye can probably speak to that too. I know that the, the Energy Institute at UT has a national profile. I speak to your colleague, Michael Weber, all the time. So what, what do you think is driving so much of that momentum? Great. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for teeing that up and John for that question. If it is okay, you know, I want to take a, a step back, building off some things that, you know, Kelly mentioned. And, and three things I want to you know, briefly touch upon that we can pick up on their questions. One is just a couple of years ago, we attracted Army Futures Command, one of the biggest efforts uh, by the Army in the last several decades. And then just a few months ago, Tesla announced that they're going to be here. So you see both from the side of government as well as from private sector, the, the biggest and the most ambitious are coming to Austin. So that, that's, that's very exciting. Many of the city of Austin and Austin Energies and other uh, work that is being done by our local government uh, bodies and, and agencies really is helping build onto that. So it, it's not happening all organically. There's a lot of you know, background work that happens and as Kelly mentioned, has been happening for the last several decades, right? So it goes back at least four decades. Of, of, so you know, that, you know, that helps. Uh, more and more companies and workers are coming here uh, by, the, by the week. We all know that as, as citizens of the city. And that's very exciting that because, you know, people of all professions um, are increasingly finding that this is both a place uh, to live as citizens, but then also provides them with the opportunity. And then it's, it's really, you know, I've been here in Austin a little over 10 years now. It's, it's a very, very special moment uh, of time in Austin. We'll, we'll all look back, uh, you know, 20, 30, 50 years uh, from now and look back at this moment saying this was very, very pivotal. What got, got us here? Uh, what really got us here is I think, you know, fundamentally number one, and I will, this will come back again and again is the community. Uh, a few years ago, I had the great honor and privilege of serving on Austin Energy's Electricity Ut Utility Commission. Um, and one of the things, you know, one of the, the single most important thing I always remember from the monthly meetings is the community. Folks from the community was, were always there participating, sharing, providing input, being, providing you know, uh, activism as well. So this is a very, very engaged community. You know, where we are is fundamentally building on that community spirit. It will remain very, very important. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, also lots of investments, a lot of the things that Austin Energy did, you know, largely you know, because of you know, what the community wanted, also how city management really played into all of that. Uh, that's all been you know, very, very, very important. 
focus on innovation. You know, uh, you all already mentioned the work that UT does, but then also, you know, Texas A&M, University of Houston, Rice, you know, this is, this is, I mean, Austin is, is in at the center of, you know, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, which are, you know, powerhouses, uh, global powerhouses in their own, you know, and, and historically, and even today, in many ways, continue to be actually bigger uh, than, than Austin. So, you know, that split very importantly, Dell, Samsung, you know, th this all started mid 80s and then have been playing out since. Uh, and then, you know, finally, I'll just say on, on uh, you know, what got us here is uh, this building up things on top of each other. And this did not happen overnight. It was, you know, uh, not everything was, you know, thought through, but then also, you know, there's some bigger pieces that are put in place and then the community really helped us that build. Very quickly, I'll just mention before, you know, uh, uh, stopping is how to get there, right? You know, we are, we are here in this moment. What we are really looking for is a massive socioeconomic change, not just here, but in Texas and broadly uh, in the U.S. and globally. And that is, you know, essentially we have to mitigate environmental impacts of you know, energy production and use. Uh, you know, you, you, John, you mentioned some of the actions of the Biden administration so early in, in its days uh, is, is just a signal of, of what already has been happening in other parts of the world, including Europe and some parts of Asia. Uh, and that's going to grow certainly for the next years. And uh, it, is, it is going to require much bigger, deeper action. So, you know, we really need to continue the fabric of and focus of the community. Our extreme importance on equity and equal opportunity, right? Historically, I mean, there's a huge part of the discussion is energy injustices of the past and how we don't want to carry those forward. And then finally, our focus on uh, investments and innovation. It's not going to happen. There are still many, many opportunities in hydrogen, in carbon capture and storage, in rare earth mining, recycling, in grid and power electronics. There are big opportunities, but there are equally big problems that need to be addressed. And here in Austin, we have that moment to invest proactively. So I'll stop there, but thanks, you know, where we are, thanks what got us here, and then the very important things you need to keep in mind to go there. Yeah, Dr. Rai, you spoke to the, the two prongs, the private investment as well as uh, government as a driving force of that. And we know that private investment is going to drive innovation, but governments, municipalities, and central governments can really uh, play a role in setting a tone um, for that equity that you talked about in this sector. And Suzanne, you probably can speak to that too with your work in, in working with um, municipalities, governments to, to embrace this idea that clean energy, renewable resources can be a sustainable and, and equitable path forward. Yeah, absolutely, John. Um, in Epicon Street, we really focus on trying to um, accelerate innovation around clean energy and conservation solution development, as well as market adoption. Um, and I would actually argue that government investment is really critical to drive innovation. If you look at all the work of the Department of Energy and RPE, but also states like California and New York, California has the EPIC program, New York has NYSERDA, that for a long time have been investing even more in driving innovation around clean energy, um, again, both in early development of products, providing support for startups, bridge funding, and connecting opportunities for companies to come and learn about the innovative startups that are, that are growing in those communities, um, but also funding for demonstration projects, which we know are critical, particularly for clean energy when we need utilities, uh, which don't have a business model for the most part that really reward risk. Um, and innovation and technology, we need to have a lot of demonstration projects to look at how these new clean energy, smart homes, smart building technologies are gonna impact the grid um, and how utilities can plan for them and, and take advantage of those emerging private sector investments around clean energy to make our energy supply more affordable, greener, more reliable as well. Um, so I think as far as looking at the trends that have gotten us here in Austin to really be uh, the clean energy capital of the world, Callie and Varun have done a great job in covering that. And also a huge shout out to Callie's team because they just really work hard representing Austin um, and helping bring those companies here for all of us. Um, but I think it also is just an indicator of the trend globally that clean energy is going to be one of the largest sectors of growth uh, around the world. And so both as a city and a state, I think we would be foolhardy at this moment where we really need a lot of economic development and growth to not be leaning 100% into clean energy. 
Uh, we are primed to do that better than probably anywhere else in the world. Um, but we do need a lot more commitment from our state and from other community leaders outside of Austin to both invest in that R&D, but to continue to invest in the public universities that churn out these amazing researchers like Varun and his team that are drawing companies here. Um, and also the quality of life that the employees at these companies wanna have with really great public transportation, really great schools. Um, there's, there's an, we know what the pathway looks like to get there. I think just getting more um, public sector buy-in that clean energy is not political anymore. It's just the future of energy is gonna be critical to seeing that be realized over the next five years. But Austin's a fun place to be doing this right now for sure. And Nate, interested to hear from you too on the, on the business side of things and you're consulting with uh, the private sector. How did these com conversations come, out, come up and play out with, with the businesses that are already actively pursuing these efforts and then also the ones that are, are just now catching up? What, what do you see? Well, I think there are two ways of looking at this, right? There's uh, where is money being invested and how much of it, how, what's the growth rate on that? And also just how does, how's rhetoric shifted around it, right? So, you know, uh, the U.S. invested $59 billion, uh, in clean energy projects uh, in 2019, and that's up from 11.3 in 2005. Um, so people know it's a good investment. Uh, those investment rates are going up uh, quite quickly. And then the Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, or CRESS, they just released a poll recently that showed that 74% of Americans, including 59% of Republicans, support increased government uh, action to boost clean energy development. 82% uh, of voters, including 78% of Republicans, support providing tax credits uh, to companies and individuals that invest in clean energy projects, which obviously is going to incentivize uh, companies to be taking up those projects to keep that kind of stuff in mind. I just saw actually before we started this that they may have been released before, but uh, they're pushing it today that GM has a goal of being carbon neutral by 2040. Um, they wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't consumer demand. They wouldn't be doing that if there weren't government incentives for them to move away from oil and gas. So I think that's a big deal. Um, and, you know, we've seen movement federally with Biden's uh, climate change executive orders of the last week, like has already been discussed. Uh, and then there's bipartisan legislation that was passed uh, in December with the Energy Act of 2020 and our own Texas Senator John Cornyn. Uh, supported that, which I think is great, right? I mean, this is that's a sign that this is not a partisan issue anymore, as Suzanne said. This is just common sense. We have to move that direction. Things are already moving that direction. Um, and it, you know, from the standpoint of the way that our companies, the companies that we're talking to are thinking about this stuff, you know, they understand that it's just, it's a growth opportunity. Um, it's great for the environment. Um, yes, uh, it's great for things related to climate and climate justice. Uh, and things like that. And uh, it also happens to be a pretty good uh, plank as, a, as part of your business plan. Um, and, you know, again, as has been touched on, I think uh, Central Texas uh, specifically and Texas in general is quite well primed, not just because politically we kind of move in that direction anyway. And so therefore consumer demand is going to be higher, but we're pretty well primed just given the amount of land we have to work with, um, given the amount of uh, energy related money that's already in the state um, and the, the desire for people who have maybe been working in oil and gas to continue working in energy related projects. That's an easier switch uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, maybe worker retraining and, bring, and things like that. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think the possibilities are quite endless uh, and the, the clients that we work with and the people that we talk to in the business community understand that as well. Yeah, very well said. And I want to get back into the, the politics of, of energy, too, like you were speaking about, especially what we saw in the campaign trail ahead of November, but also with the, the incoming Biden administration. We can get to that in a second. I want to drill down a little bit more into Austin's future, though, too. So because Austin is a hub for next gen renewable technology, what opportunities do you all see in the near future for expanding our clean energy workforce here, especially as we revitalize our economy after the COVID-19 pandemic? Anything. Suzanne, where are you going to go? <laughs> oh, I was going to say, um, I think Callie should jump in, but, but I do want to make sure you talk about, Callie and I had an interesting conversation yesterday about this topic of um, the kinds of jobs that clean energy is bringing to Austin, because it's unique in that it's not just high tech where you need an advanced degree to get a job with a company like that. Um, there's a lot of manufacturing that's coming to Austin around electric vehicles and solar 
Um, but even in other kinds of technology, like Apple has a large customer service center here in Austin. And so that's one of the really, um, I think, beneficial aspects of bringing more clean energy development and economic development to Austin is the wide variety of jobs that we that we can get from that. Um, but we had an interesting conversation because I had assumed that a lot of those manufacturing jobs, particularly with the EV plants that are coming, would mean we have more blue collar job opportunities here. So more equitable um, economic opportunities for our community. Um, and Callie pointed out some interesting things that are driving a lot of the, the manufacturing those blue collar jobs actually outside of the city of Austin limits. And I think it would be great to talk about that on this webinar, Callie, if you don't mind. <laughs> wow, okay, thanks for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'll be happy to touch back on that. I just kind of wanted to back up a little bit because uh, you know, it might be helpful to discuss Opportunity Austin, which is the organization that I work for. So it is a five county economic development organization that is run through the Austin Chamber. And so our entire mission is to bolster the regional, the five county regional economy and create those diverse jobs. So in 2004, a lot of our local um, civic and business leaders got together and decided, okay, because we were a tech town at that time, right? They said, we need to diversify the types of jobs that are coming here. And I think they've done a pretty good job since 2004 in doing that and expanding the types of industries that are here. And um, so that's kind of a, a little bit about where I come from. But the funny or the interesting thing is Dr. Ryan mentioned, this has been a concerted effort for the past several decades in um, renewables. We didn't just get here by chance. But the city of Austin and Austin Energy, they're the reason that I have the job that I have. They were focused on clean energy jobs, so that's why that is what what I that's why it's what I do for a living. Um, and so the city of Austin itself is really focused on bringing these clean energy jobs, these manufacturing jobs. They want those types of jobs in the city. They want our workforce to be able to go, whether it's direct to college or direct to employment. Um, and so they're wanting to incentivize those jobs. Some companies, if they're seeking incentives. It is harder for these lower paying manufacturing jobs um, for these large companies where incentives are really important to receive the Texas Enterprise, Enterprise Fund, which is known as the governor's uh, deal closing fund, because of the fact that these jobs have to meet the average county wage where they're locating in order to qualify. And so because Travis County has a, a very high average wage, we're at about 72,000 now here in Travis County, a lot of these lower paying and more equitable jobs um, don't meet that threshold. And so sometimes corporations are driven into lower cost areas or lower um, average wage areas. And so it's kind of a, while the city is prioritizing it, oh, and this is not, I, I wouldn't say this is a, it, for every company that this happens, but there are some larger corporate institutions where those incentives really help them get off the ground and or it's a, it's a focus of where they're going to locate. So it, it's definitely a fact. It's an interesting thing. And it's something that we're working closely with all entities involved to try and uh, figure out how we can alleviate that to encourage them to come back in the city. But the good news is we have the five county region and there are still tons of opportunities available there that are going to help central Texans um, to create these jobs as well. So I think we're still positioned in a good place. Well, and, and I just wanted to add, you know, uh, you mentioned Austin Energy uh, has a goal or we're currently at what, 55% of our energy consumption is clean energy sources. We want to be, uh, you know, completely powered or we want to have, we want to have 55% uh, by uh, 2025 and one third are currently being powered by clean energy sources. We've got uh, the Prop A passed, uh, which means we're gonna be building out, you know, uh, we're gonna be replacing our bus lines with clean energy buses. We've got light rail coming in. There's gonna be a lot of job opportunities through that. Um, I think with a, with a Pete Buttigieg run uh, uh, Department of Transportation, there's a good chance that maybe we're seeing those, uh, that funding from the federal level come in exactly as it was planned. You know, so I think I think there's going to be a lot that are coming through public works projects um, that will be magnets to bring, uh, you know, 
really great uh, kind of blue collar work into Austin uh, and, and kind of solidify its place here a little bit more because the maintenance is going to be ongoing uh, and things like that. And the last thing I would say is just that, you know, I think one thing that we're going to really have to think about as a city in regards to clean energy and climate, uh, and, and this is a big energy project uh, in and of itself, is, you know, more dense housing and, and things like that. And that construction, uh, the conversion uh, over to clean energy, uh, you know, could in in itself be a really uh, important step uh, that we need to take. I agree. Anyone? I think there's going to be all sorts of, uh, there's all sorts of potential within the city to continue to increase these number of jobs. And, you know, you can't even say that manufacturing isn't coming to Austin because Tesla and because Capsum, which right. is owned by Chanel, that has their manufacturing plant, Southeast Austin at Velocity Crossing, they are using only, they, they drilled a well to use only non-potable water for their organic skincare products. They have solar arrays on site. They're about mm-hmm. one of the cleanest manufacturing operations. So that's just a small number of projects that it's not happening, but it is, it, it's just something that comes up from time to time. Um, but I still mm-hmm. think we're positioned to continue to create. John, I know you want to move on to the next question, but a couple of things that came up, uh, but I do want to highlight them. We have a very large oil and gas workforce in Texas. Uh, some of that will continue. A lot of that could continue. You know, I mentioned hydrogen. I mentioned, you know, uh, potential ways to continue to mitigate impacts of methane emissions. And, you know, natural gas could have a very big future. Uh, certainly, you know, that would play into Texas's strength. While these changes happen, you know, there is a huge responsibility nationally, statewide, locally also in Austin to work with our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors, uh, and this workforce to very responsibly and very proactively move them into these newer areas that that build upon oil and gas strength or to invest very systematically to retrain, skill up, and move them into newer jobs. That's not, you know, while we get very excited about here, here is uh, all the growth and here's all the opportunities, we have equally big responsibility in making sure that it brings together the entire state and all our people. I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, if we all have to, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a great opportunity for Austin and Austin has really been leading in many ways, but the problem is global. Uh, and there's no hope to address the global problem unless there is deep social commitment and support behind it. And that will only happen when everybody, the masses really see this in their interest of family and this is not about you know money but this is about you know survival right so you know everybody has to so i, I think that's a very huge point we we as austinites have, have you know have a big role to play in that the second point is growth as a lot of this growth is happening and so you know i think i'll, I'll echo what susan mentioned about you know kelly and her team and the city's work and really taking that effort to bring in these companies but you know showcase to them what different you know parts of the city really do them, and I've been in several of those meetings. It's just fascinating to watch the process and be part of that and contribute. Right, you you feel in that moment that these companies are you know looking, they're very excited and they actually care about what we are all able to offer as a as a city. As we go down this path of you know really very exciting growth, well you know growth with a singular focus on on money and economy has all sorts of distorting pulls. Right. Something I mentioned earlier is the aspect of community. Why are we here? Uh, because of the community that Austin is. We have to make sure as these developments happen, as we grow, how do we keep that community? Because you know we'll be bringing in newer people, you know, you know, different views, and that's all actually strength. But but you know, how does do we all assimilate that within that fabric of community from an Austin's internal perspective, I think you know, that's profoundly important. So these two things, how do we bring the masses together uh, in, this, in this massive change? And then also how do we preserve and build on and keep the positive, proactive community fabric of Austin? Well, and Dr. Rai, I think you kind of touched on uh, the politics angle really briefly. I want, I want you to drill into that a little more because I'm you know, the politics reporter here on this panel. But um, you, you heard a lot in, on the campaign trail before November that uh, then candidate Joe Biden wanted to transition away from oil and gas. And there was a lot made of that here in Texas as, as one of those kind of tentpole issues on the campaign trail, regardless of what the race was. But the market forces, which we usually look at to see, to see how we're evolving and changing, 
ha have been saying that we need to transition away from oil and gas for years. The, the impact on Texas that that industry had 20 years ago is not what it is today. So what, what, are, what are independent producers, um, Shell, for example, has said it needs to transition away from oil and gas. What is the market privately telling us about where this uh, renewable energy industry has gone? You know, I, I am curious to hear what, you know, all my co-panelists are uh, thinking on this. And, you know, I'll, I'll not talk about any, any one company in particular. You know, what is important to keep in mind, John, is these are all very large companies that have international presence, right? So this is, this is not new for any of these companies. While, you know, in Austin or in Texas or even, uh, you know, nationally, we have seen pulls and pushes in different directions in terms of, you know, where we want to head and what the balance is between, you know, conventional versus, you know, the, the new, newer types of, you know, uh, technologies and sources. Uh, many of these companies have been experiencing that elsewhere, for example, example in Europe, right? So it, it's a balance. It's a, it's a question of certainty, right? And, and as things become more clear, uh, you know, you, you mentioned markets and, you know, companies are very good at following signals, right? And, you know, may often, you know, already in this conversation, we have talked about government investments and incentives and direction more so, right? You know, government acts on behalf of the society and in the betterment of the society. And, you know, if we have clarity on what that direction is, you know, companies are very good at following that, but it requires that commitment and clarity. And, you know, we are starting to see that emerge. And flashes of that were already, you know, there, uh, there elsewhere. So I, I think, you know, John, you, we will see, you know, continued uh, investments and continued change. Something that the jury is still out, right, is, you know, it's, there is a lot of work uh, in terms of what can be done with carbon capture and storage and hydrogen. There are, there's a lot of open discussion. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I write about this all the time is, you know, when we talk about the full transition, and by full transition, I mean, you know, uh, uh, net zero carbon emissions by, you know, in the next uh, three to five decades, the pathways to get there, there are still multiple technological pathways to get there. There is no single clear dominant solution that I know of that has been declared. I'm sorry, there's, you know, that cannot be said. Of course, you know, we all do our own scientific models and projections. Uh, we, know, we know we need to get there. Uh, and so, you know, th there, there are multiple pathways where, Many of the work that happens uh, across the world uh, in, in major companies re remains very important. And I'm seeing, I'm very excited. Every, every day I'm in you know, meetings where I'm seeing new enthusiasm, interest, and investments uh, by uh, corporations across the world in, in really thinking very deeply and trying to be part of this, uh, this change. So I'm, I'm actually very excited. This is a this is great time to be uh, helping everybody, but also, you know, being actually uh, in the moment. And I'd, I'd love to jump in and just, I think it's important to point out that there are two trends that are happening right now on the investment side that are um, important to watch that can help accelerate and expand Austin's clean energy economic growth here. Um, one is exactly what you touched on, John, and what Varun was talking about, which is that we have a federal government that has set clear policies very quickly that gives signal to the markets here in the United States that align with these trends that we've been seeing globally, both again in policy around climate and decarbonization, but also market trends in other countries. So we now have this clear policy, clear market signal here in the US that clean tech, that ag tech, you know, any kind of climate technology is gonna be a pretty good investment. Um, and at the same time with where we're at in our economy and a real need for rapid economic growth, um, we have, a huge surge in capital right now in private sector investment that's looking for growth stage companies to invest in. And clean tech and climate tech are where a lot of these investors are trying to put their money because we've got these clear federal signals, uh, I'm gonna say at last, <laughs> that help them know there's gonna be a certain market, certainty of market here in the United States for those products. Um, and also support on the research and development side for funding. So we have a moment that probably is really going to last about a year with the availability and the excitement of a lot of private sector investment and growth stage companies in Austin, particularly, again, is primed to take advantage of that. And a lot of the work that Cali and Austin Technology Incubator are doing, I think, are going to set us up for even more rapid growth over the next 12 to 18 months. 
Um, and again, I think there's huge opportunity statewide to capture these opportunities, but that's going to take more state level uh, public sector buy-in. Um, I thought it was really interesting that during the Trump years, uh, where there was definitely not uh, much uh, support for clean energy projects, at least rhetorically, that that is when you started seeing a lot of these major companies, you know, Shell, BP, uh, you know, and, and I think some of this boils down to the fact that states like California and New York have changed their standards and it's kind of forced some of these uh, companies who, you know, have massive markets in those states to have to shift and that changes their their calculus entirely for the entire country. But, you know, these large corporations were acknowledging that they had to move in that direction. They needed to move in the direction of clean energy. Um, and, you know, I think that means that the, the government's maybe, you know, catching up to at least rhetorically where the private market was now and hopefully exceeds it and puts some of those uh, incentives and funding structures in place. But another thing that I'd note is that, you know, the price of electricity from solar is like down 89% over 10 years, you know, and that is due to the work uh, that a lot of folks have been doing uh, to kind of get that down. But I think now that those price points are getting so low on clean energy solutions, it means that you may have this sort of like very slowly and then all at once, uh, you, there's a, an opportunity for that, right? Uh, and I think we're starting to see some of that movement um, now. Uh, and I think that there's, I mean, again, uh, just keep hitting it, uh, hitting that uh, gong that Texas has, you know, some of the biggest opportunities possible in this space because so much of its economy is already built on uh, energy in general. I want to get one more question for the panel in here. And remember, you can ask your questions for the panel here in the Q&A. We've already got a couple good ones, so I want to leave enough time to get to those. Um, I think it was you, Callie, who touched on equity um, early on. And I'd like to, to get into that a little bit more. Um, how does clean energy help underserved communities in Austin? And what more can be done to make sure that there is that equity and access piece to this? Okay, sure. And I really think that... Uh, Suzanne needs to chime in here too. Because Whoever there wants it. <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I will um, speak just a, a little bit, but uh, Suzanne and Pecan Street are kind of leading the charge in something that is um, going to revol revolutionize the future. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a huge priority for them, but I'll, I'll let her speak to that. Um, what's happening here locally in Austin, I, I think we still have a ways to go as far as what we're doing with renewables and how they're serving um, our underserved community here locally, but it is a focus and there are conversations in the city of Austin's economic um, development department with Austin Energy to find ways um, to have, to come up with ways where they can put more programs in place that where renewables are uh, affecting or are helping those communities. And, but if you think about the types of companies that we have here, some of the ways that renewables are already affecting um, our, these communities is like Icon 3D printing. So they print uh, affordable homes. They're working with mobile loaves and fishes uh, for their uh, community first program that is, um, so they're creating affordable homes for uh, some of our homeless population here. And so then Icon is a very low um, emission manufacturer here. So you've got a lot of people in our uh, innovation community and our startup community that are coming up with technologies that where they're implementing it. It might not be large scale now, but there are tons of examples like the icons um, that are helping here locally, just because that's what Austin is about, right? The people are great and they love helping their community. Suzanne, you wanna jump in there? She Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, so as in regards to Austin and, and equity around clean energy, um, we, we do have a lot of work that we can do in that regard. Um, Austin really is, I think there's two Austins right now. Um, and if you live here, you're gonna think I'm, I'm talking about North and South Austin. <laughs> um, but we really have white Austin and then Austin's community of color. Uh, Austin is the most racially segregated city in the United States. Um, and Austin Energy and the city have been leading the charge for the past year and thinking about what does climate equity mean? 
what does that mean when we really try to put that into the form of policies and investments and action as a community? And we have a draft climate equity plan that the city council, I hope, will be adopting soon. I think they will, um, that the, the city put together in collaboration with the community, with a few hundred community members that participated in that year-long process. Um, and what that's going to look like are, are a lot of the things that Callie talked about, which is really thinking differently and more innovatively about what do solar rebates look like. It's going to include a lot of the work of Varun's team around community solar, innovative financing around electric vehicles, um, and more public services rather than rebates for private citizens to be able to invest in clean energy and then participate in those markets. So I think we're going to see a lot of really cool policy development at the municipal level that, again, Austin's going to be a leader on nationally, um, really pivoting that climate movement around equity. Um, and then more broadly, we at Pecan Street have been working for the past couple of years to think about how do we also pivot this just general early adopter model um, so that it's not focused around a typical early adopter profile, which is higher income, well-educated family, which here in the United States usually means white household. Um, and how do we really create community informed technology around clean energy and climate innovation that brings together a broader swath of the United States? Uh, so uh, we're going to soon be launching the Center for Race, Energy, and Climate Justice, where we're going to seek to bridge a lot of those research gaps, data gaps, information gaps that exist just generally in the private sector around technology development and what does America look like and what does America want. Um, and then also bringing to the forefront solutions for technology development, but also policy development um, that are going to prioritize investing in communities and households of color. And so, for example, here in Austin, as I mentioned, we've got Austin Technology Incubator. We've got a, a really wonderful community that supports our entrepreneurs here in the community. Um, but I think there's more that we could do to really focus our support and our resources around our local communities of color. Um, getting in and identifying Black entrepreneurs and Hispanic entrepreneurs that are developing solutions that come from their unique perspective um, and trying to wrap the services around those entrepreneurs that are going to go out and change the world, but right now really lack a clear pathway for how to engage in these spaces, uh, technology and clean energy that are predominantly white. Um, so I'm excited about where we'll go over the next year. And again, a huge shout out to Callie and Varun as well for their leadership in these spaces. Sounds like a great local news politics story. So I'll be <laughs> calling you in a couple of weeks. Um, I want to leave some time to get to some questions here. So if you have been sitting on a question, feel free to put it in the chat box there. Um, click the q and A. I'll share these and whoever wants to jump in and go after them. I appreciate the, the people being patient with us getting to these. The question is, you mentioned incentives in Texas, renewable energy generation rides on Chapter 313 tax incentives. Do you foresee any changes in Chapter 313 or other incentive programs this legislative session affecting renewable energy in Texas or Austin specifically? I saw this one in the chat early, so I'll, I'll jump in. I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I mean, Chapter 313 is going, if if there are any changes to it, it's going to have a huge impact on renewables, right? Chapter 313 has been instrumental in a lot of our large scale renewable projects that have happened in this state. Uh, I could tell you our advocacy team at the chamber is working very hard to uh, advocate for the funding of Chapter 313 and to not eliminate that. So it's a, it's a huge priority for us. Um, what we're working on. And what about additional incentives? Anyone have any ideas on what could potentially be coming either federally or, or here at the state level? I think, you know, federally, you know, you'll see, you're already starting to see several things in terms of exactly what shape the incentives take or other programs, uh, you know, those will depend, but you will see, you know, a lot more investment in the incentives uh, from the federal level, from the state level, not in terms of what will happen in, in, in this list particularly, but, but in terms of going back to looking forward and really building up of the strengths we have in Austin, but, but really more broadly in Texas, this, this really massive experience, massive investment, massive capital, international uh, workforce to build upon, how do we, and, and knowing that really the winds of change are very strong, right? And again, this is not new for our companies. They have been in the midst of this, you know, uh, uh, for, for many, many years. 
uh, but but working with them and helping them to really uh, reinvent themselves or reposition themselves, if you will, and also along with them, their employees, and make sure everybody has a good and strong future. And that is where I really think you know a lot of thinking at all levels in Texas, you know, local uh, as well as in above, is needed. Uh, what can we be doing to support things in? future of the grid in power electronics, that's a huge area of interest that really plays into the strength of you know, Austin and Texas. Uh, and and you know, it's really a lot of the future uh, everywhere is built upon a lot of things getting electrified, right? So that's, that's a huge opportunity. I mean, Texas has great experience doing that. Can we play into that? Carbon capture and storage is, you know, has potentially a huge role. Texas already is a leader in that. How can we further accelerate that journey working in, in, with, with what else might be happening elsewhere. And then I already mentioned hydrogen and pathways for natural gas. You know, these are very important things and you know, there are not you know, hundreds of these things. There are big buckets of the, what you already know. How do we proactively and very systematically now come together and support this? I think that's going to be very important. Nate, do you want to weigh in on that, on the importance for, for incentives to drive that business investment as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, he's a controversial figure and lots of people have lots of thoughts on him. Uh, but the governor was very uh, excited to welcome Elon Musk in uh, to Texas. I think the truth is that, you know, any kind of business growth is going to be incentivized in a state like Texas. And anytime you can bring in kind of a heavy hitter in the business world who's doing some uh, real innovation around anything, uh, Texas is going to be welcoming to that person and to that company. I think, you know, here in Austin, we have a, a, a real responsibility to make sure that uh, Tesla comes in and becomes a constructive part of the community and that we are thinking about how they contribute from an equitable standpoint and things like that, that it's not driving displacement uh, and stuff like that as much as possible. But it is a big opportunity and it is good and it does signal that I think Texas uh, is ready for and is interested in that stuff. I think there are lots of political reasons for uh, Texas politicians to you know, kind of cater to oil and gas, but that doesn't mean that they may not be uh, making moves on the legislative side. I haven't seen anything yet. I should have done my research. I should have assumed that a question like this would have been asked. But uh, my assumption is that, you know, there may be some moves that move in that direction to further incentivize clean energy, to further uh, retrain a workforce uh, that maybe was previously working in oil and gas. And as much as, you know, Texas likes to take the fight to the federal level, uh, in most cases for things like this, if it's a jobs related program, which I know the Biden administration and the president have really, really focused on angling their clean energy and climate programs to towards being seen as a big jobs program, you know, Texas is not going to turn down money for jobs. Um, and so I think, I think it's looking pretty good. Um, and, you know, I just think uh, we're, we're the only state in the lower 48 with our own uh, power grid. We have a lot of power, pun intended, I guess, over what we can do uh, with this. So yeah, I'm, I, I feel, I don't know anything specifically, um, but I've, I'm feeling pretty good about the winds of change, as Dr. Rice said. Winds of change. Great, great we song have a lot and, of great, power. And, and great podcast. I also said that we needed to drill down when having a conversation about oil and gas. So <laughs> I think we've I think we've hit all the boxes on the bingo sheet this We're time. We're getting some puns and we've got some good like 80s rock, I don't know, vibes going. It's an electric conversation. We have time for Ooh. one more um, question. I really like this one. So what do you recommend citizens, especially college students, should do to help grow the clean energy industry and combat climate change? Who wants it? Uh, I'll say start a company. If you have a great idea, start a company. Try and make it happen. Don't be afraid. This is the time. Yeah, you know, I'll just say, you know, a, a lot of what is happening is, you know, really your future. This is, you all are starting to help build it and you will most certainly live in it. Uh, and, and really, you know, what we have seen from the youth in the last uh, decade or so, really taking this up and challenging uh, us, the, <laughs> the more grown-ups, to say, hey, why are you guys messing up with our future? In, in all sorts of ways. And this is not limited to just energy, right? But this is, you know, this is also about information. This is also about, you know, how we interact as citizens and how we think about, you know, our, our you know, exchanges and, and thinking of uh, societies. 
And and so you know, you guys have a. I mean, this is this is your future, and and we all are trying to do our part in in anticipating that. We have been all fortunate, I and mean, literally, right? You know, the fact that we are all here. What is what has been the conversation? Well, how great a time it is for Austin. Aren't we also very fortunate? Yes, we play into it, but we are also very fortunate. We really have that responsibility to work with all the energy and dedication we have to make sure that we all are able to give you all a future in Austin and elsewhere for that matter, that, that some in the future, you can have a similar discussion uh, like this about, you know, talking about great times and great winds of change. So, uh, you know, this will not happen without you because this is your future. So do everything you can do. And, you know, certainly as Susan said, one of the great things you can do in Austin is to start, start companies. I'd, I'd add three things. Uh, yes, start a company. Two, if you're much smarter than me, which I would assume you probably are, <laughs> uh, get involved in science, uh, you know, uh, start creating those solutions that somebody else, you can work with somebody else to, to run the business side of it. Um, and then number three, um, you know, if I've learned anything over the last few years, it's that politics looks scary, but actually like everybody's kind of making it up as they go. Uh, and so if you want to get involved and advocate, I would highly recommend, you know, there's tons of there's tons of stuff happening here locally, tons of stuff happening at the state level, tons of stuff happening at the federal level. Uh, and it it is worth it to jump in and get a feel for how to talk to lawmakers uh, and interest groups uh, about how to shape uh, that policy as well. So uh, it's it's only slightly terrifying for about three minutes until you start talking to a politician and, and you realize they're just like you and they're pretending as and, well. And know that those emails and those phone calls, they work. I they mean, do, when, do. when members get those calls and those emails they and they get pestered, they, they think differently. Mm -hmm. Callie, any final mm -hmm. thoughts here? I, I was just going to piggyback on what Nathan and what you just um, said. Getting involved is so important. I mean, it makes a, a world of difference. And one thing that I, I just remembered when we were talking about what's happening in the new legislative session, that's something to watch that I think would be of interest for people on this call, is there is a new bill proposed in the Senate that it's Senate Bill 170 that would require the Public Utility Commission to study the feasibility of 50% of generating capacity in the state coming from renewables by 2030. So it's a stepping stone to carbonization. Might be one to watch, might be, uh, for those people looking to get involved for the first time, that might be your first reach out. Uh, Cause I think that would be a pretty important first step. And I think it's pretty cool. Something like that's even in the legislative session, so. Suzanne, final thought before we head out. Oh, Callie, you're so awesome. That was, I'm going to close thought. with what That's Callie it. said. Call your local representative about that bill. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you to all of you, uh, Dr. Rye, Suzanne Russo, Callie Taylor, Nathan Ryan, Mr. Ryan. We appreciate you. And thank you to the LBJ Foundation and Future Forum for hosting us. I will send it back to Amy Garza. Thanks, John. So many thanks to our panelists and giving you all uh, our your time. Um, I just wanted to you know, say that if you're not a Future Forum member, definitely take a look at our website uh, for a series of events in addition to potentially becoming a member at lbjfutureforum.org. And just to let you know, next month, we'll host a preview of the legislative session and uh, for members only, a live Q&A with Tanya Williams, who served as Director of Legislative Affairs for then Vice President, President Biden. More details are available on the website. Y'all have a great afternoon and certainly look forward to seeing y'all soon again. <laughs>